get the brain back into chapters eight and nine. A sequence is a, an ordered list of numbers, basically. Lost our screen share. Let's try this again. There we go. And so a simple example would just be something like uh, 3, 7, 11, 25. And a sequence can be finite or infinite, but it's just a, a set of numbers that are listed in a particular order. And then a series is just when you have that exact same thing, but you add them up. So we want to kind of keep in mind the difference between a sequence and a series because as the notation gets thick and confusing, um, it's easy to lose track of which one of those things we were talking about along the way. So we had various notations for these things and you have to kind of think about them in advance. So if I write, for example, a set notation bracket and A sub K, then that's referring to a series. And if I want to show that I have a, I'm sorry, that that's referring to a sequence, just make up my own mistakes here. That's referring to a sequence. And if I instead want to refer to a series, since the only difference is that in the series I add those terms up, we just instead use a, a summation notation in front. So series have the summation notation in front and sequences have usually the set bracket notation to distinguish between the two. All right, so that's um, the basic setup. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at an example or two in the problem sets. Again, we can't in any way possible, even in two and a half hours, replicate all of the explanations about everything in chapters eight and nine. So what we'll do is just put a little reminder at the beginning of each um, particular section we're looking at as to what the section was about and then look at an example to illustrate uh, the kind of problems that arose from that. All right, so I'm going to take a look at, let's see here. I think I need more page space. All right, so I'm gonna scratch this out and then we'll do an example. So examples are, uh, the exercise set for section 8.1 is on page 604. And let's uh, try grabbing something. Maybe let's take a look at number 20. So it gives the following, a sub n plus one is equal to a sub n squared minus one. And it also provides the fact that a sub one equals one. So the instructions are to write the first four terms of the sequence defined by the following re reoccurrence relations. So we're supposed to write the four first four terms. So this uh, notation tells us that the way we get the n plus one term in the sequence is by taking the nth term, the one before it, squaring it, and then subtracting one. And it tells us which the first term is. So the idea is from this knowledge, we can write the first four terms. We know the first term is a one. And so then we can get the second term by following the formula which would therefore, therefore be a one squared, one squared minus one, which would be one minus one, which would equal zero. So then we can write the third term by saying, okay, for the third term, we're going to take the second term, which was a zero, square it and subtract one. So that would be negative one. And for the fourth term, we're going to take 
the third term, which was negative one, square it and subtract one. Negative one squared is positive one. One minus one equals zero. And so in this way, we've seen, been able to see the first four terms of the sequence. Sometimes it's good to sort of just write the results in order. So I could write something like the sequence of a sub n's started with a one, then it gave a zero, then it gave a negative one, then it gave a zero. And we might even be able to predict the fact that we can see by this pattern, once you get a zero and you plug that into the recursive formula definition, like we did when we were from two going to three, then we would go back. Uh, and from a zero, when you plug that in, you get a negative one. And when you plug in a negative one, you get a zero. And when you plug in a zero, you get a negative one. So this is an interesting sequence and it will just keep going. It's an interesting sequence because it started with a one, but then after giving a one, which led to a zero, it continues to oscillate between zeros and negative ones after that. So there's uh, an example um, using uh, what they introduced, one of the things they introduced in 8.1, which is the idea of expressing a sequence using a recurrence relation or a recursive definition where you define the n plus one term based on the previous term to show how you move down the sequence. Questions, comments, or discussions about this example of one of the problems from 8.1? And we will do, uh, we'll do more than just this one for this section because they're a little bit shorter in this section. Okay. All right, so let's do this. Let's clear this page. We'll do another example. Oh, I figure I'll just mention last time we had one of these um, review sessions when we did it for chapter seven, unfortunately, sometime right before we did that, the school automatically set the default for our Zoom sessions to, to be where um, posted videos had passwords attached to them without telling anybody, certainly without telling me. We didn't have that before. And then all of a sudden they introduced that. And there was no instructions that I could find anywhere about how to find that password. <laughs> and so I wasn't able to get it until several days later after we'd had the midterm. And then eventually I did find that they had buried it in the bottom of an email they had sent out sometime earlier. Uh, so I went ahead and posted that on the, on the site, um, on our uh, um, site of the videos from the previous sections. But anyway, hopefully I've changed the settings so that that won't happen anymore. If it does happen and they require a password, I will know now where to find it quickly and I will post it um, with the links to the review sessions moving forward. Okay, so having said that, let's try another example. Uh, let's see, maybe move to page 605. And uh, try one a little further down. Uh, so maybe let's jump down to maybe number 35. So the instructions for this batch says, write the first four terms of the sequences. If the sequence appears to converge, make a conjecture about its limit. If the sequence diverges, explain why. So this is a good example to illustrate that uh, we introduced this concept uh, uh, some window here. Okay. So um, if we, uh, uh, one of the things that this illustrates to us is that when we have a sequence, there's the possibility that the sequence of terms themselves has a limiting value, like a limits that we discussed back in um, chapter two. Um, and that we can sort of determine whether the sequence has a limit or not, or at least make a conjecture about it. So let's look at 35 here. It gives us a formula for a sub n. a sub n is equal to negative one to the nth power 
divided by 2 to the n. Okay, so we want to write out the first four terms. So in this, we can just plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. for n. So a sub n, if I plug in a 1, I would get a negative 1 in the top and the 2 in the bottom. So the first term is negative 1 half. If I plug in a 2, then in the top, the negative 1 is squared, becoming a positive 1, and the bottom 2 squared is 4, so I got positive 1 fourth. And then if I plug in a 3, I get similarly negative 1 eighth. And if I plug in a 4, I get positive 1 sixteenth, et cetera. So there's the first four terms as requested. So it says that it wants us to make a limit as to whether this uh, converges, uh, I'm sorry, make a conjecture as about uh, whether this limit, the limit of this converges or not. And if it does, uh, guess the value. And if not, then say that it diverges. So we're basically asked to say, what is the limit as n tends to infinity of negative one to the nth power over two to the n? And so uh, we could recognize that this is a geometric series, not a series, I'm sorry, a sequence. This is a geometric sequence. Now they didn't really define those very clearly back here in 8.1. So they're having us explore a particular geometric sequence as an example without sort of labeling it clearly or talking about the value that you would get um, because they just haven't gotten to that yet. But hopefully this will be much more comfortable with us now that we've done those things and worked through this chapter. Um, and so we may recognize that this is a geometric sequence with r equal to negative one half and with a sub one equal to negative one half. And so we can remember that when r um, has an absolute value less than one, then the geometric sequence will converge. In fact, um, anytime you have a um, uh, it's almost like a power series. You, the terms themselves will go to zero. And of course, we could even determine the value of the sequence of the series if we wanted to. But in this case, we're just supposed to determine the limit of the sequence. And so since the top is just bouncing back and forth between one and negative one, and the bottom is going to infinity, the limiting value is zero. So that's all they want from us in this uh, initial problem of uh, exercise 35 from 8.1. Questions, comments, discussions about uh, these couple of examples from 8.1? Okay, hopefully so far so good. Okay, so what happened in 8.2? So they focused more on sequences, whereas in the first section, they just kind of did an overview of sequences and series. Now we started to have theorems and introduced some formula stuff a little bit in 8.2. For example, when talking about, as we just were, the limit of a sequence, um, we had a theorem that said you can basically transfer a couple of the properties of normal limits that we had for functions in chapter two onto sequences. So for example, the, if you have a sequence which is created by adding the terms of another sequence, then the limiting value of a sum of sequences is the sum of the limiting values of those sequences. Again, it sounds like word salad gibberish, um, but anyway, we did basically we had some theorems to tell us we can kind of do some of the things that we want to be able to do whenever that we used to do with limits. Um, then more importantly, we introduced a bunch of definitions in 8.2. So um, there were, let me just sort of annotate about them. We had the definitions, 
I don't want to write them all out on here in our review, but just to revert to, they were on page 608 for those who want to reference back to them where they define them. So we had like increasing, non-decreasing, decreasing, non-increasing, non monotonic, and bounded. And let's put down a couple of those. Increasing, bounded, et cetera. Um, and this ended up being important uh, because we have a theorem that comes a little later that helps us draw conclusions about sometimes when a sequence might uh, have a limiting value, converge to a limit. Uh, so one of our big theorems that was important is 8.5. Sorry for the interruption, I am back. Life continues to get in the way for all of us. Okay, so uh, yeah, theorem at 8.5. Uh, it's a very important theorem for us and that's on page 612. And it's nice and simple. It says a bounded monotonic sequence converges. Um, so again, monotonic was something that was either non-increasing or strictly increasing or decreasing. And if you put that together with it being bounded, then that means the sequence must converge. So now we're getting very conceptual in 8.2, where we've already talked and introduced and done an overview of sequences in 8.1. And so they start to get more conceptual about it. Um, and so let's uh, look at some examples from the exercise set to see what they then expected of us. They started to do more uh, problems with limits of sequences. So let's look at page 616 and grab a problem that might be helpful. Uh, let's look at 16. Maybe it looks a little bit more. It has some review in it, I think, from previous work. So this, that's a good idea. So it says, find the limit of the following sequences or determine that the limit does not exist. Find the limit or determine DNE does not exist. And uh, for 16, we have the square root of n squared plus 1, all under the root, minus n. So since we're supposed to find the limit, we're basically taking the limit as n tends to infinity of this expression. So that starts to become a lot more like a chapter two problem. So let me just take um, a 60 second pause here to see if you guys think you could do this, just to put yourself in the mindset um, and then I'll do it for you. So I'm gonna mute make myself shut up for 60 seconds and let you guys give it a try to think about it. Ask a question before I just do it for you. No questions? Okay. Okay, so um, the idea behind something like this kind of goes back to chapter two limit issues. Um, just here's the thought process I would point out is that if you, so, so let's say you were supposed to make a converge or diverge guess, that that was just where you were starting. You were basically just trying to ask yourself, does this limit exist or not, before trying to figure out, if so, what it would be. So the thought process you could use is that you basically have the something of the form where this term on the left, the square root of n squared, is kind of like an n, and as n goes to infinity, that goes to infinity. And then we have n itself, which is going to infinity. So we have the something of the form infinity minus infinity. This is an indeterminate form, 
and we are not able to just quickly determine what that would be. It, it, it sort of depends on the rate at which they are going to infinity. So that adds possibility of complexity. And so that needs to be sorted out either analytically or algebraically. And here's the way we sort it out for problems like this. You basically say, okay, um, I'm going to try to deal with the fact that I have this root that I can't combine with a non-root by multiplying this by a big fancy one. And because I have a difference with a root and I don't like the root, I'm going to use the conjugate. So the conjugate, uh, this goes back to difference of squares problems with uh, complex numbers. The conjugate is where you have the exact same two, two terms, but you change the sign in the middle, in this case from a minus to a plus. Now I can't just multiply that without ruining the expression, so I do it in the top and the bottom of a fraction because then I'm multiplying by a big fancy one that doesn't disturb the value of my expression and I get to accomplish at least in the numerator what I want. So if I multiply this then I get the limit as n tends to infinity and in the top I have something of the form a minus b times a plus b. That's why we use the conjugates to set up this difference of squares pattern and is not working nicely today. And when you multiply a minus b times a plus b, you get a squared minus b squared. So a is this root. So if I square that, the root goes away. So I'll get n squared plus one minus b squared. b is an n, which is n squared over that stuff that was still in the bottom, n squared plus one plus n. So probably anyone who was able to figure out that algebraically this is the way to move forward on the problem was probably able to do the problem. So let me pause there because it's basically the hardest 75% has been done, which was to recognize that I had to multiply by a fancy one with the conjugate. So let's pause there and see if there are any questions. All right, let's see what happens. Let's see how this helps us. So in the top, I can combine these like terms and the n squareds go away. So on the bottom, nothing really changes. I have the limit as n goes to infinity, but on the top, I just have one. And then on the bottom, since I just have an assum a summation of things that are going to infinity, I can see that the ending limit of this is zero. So I conclude that this limit of this sequence converges to zero. Questions, comments, discussions? All right, let's uh, maybe try another one from this section. <laughs> well, I don't want to do a formal proof of a limit. So maybe let's skip into the next problem sets. Okay, so I'm going to clear this page. And so let's maybe take a look at number 46. So the instructions say, Determine whether the following sequences converge or diverge and state whether they are monotonic or whether they oscillate. Give the limit when the sequence converges. So that's a lot, but let's look. The sequence they provide is 1.2 times 
to the end. So we're supposed to answer some questions. Maybe I'll make a note here. Uh, we want converge or diverge. And we want to state whether they're monotonic or oscillate. Oscillate, yeah. Something like that, I think. Uh, okay, so to determine converge or diverge, as usual, that means we're considering the limit and again, this is not a series, this is a sequence. The limit as n tends to infinity of 1.2 to the n. So 1.2 to the n. Uh, well, let me point out that anytime you're looking at a sequence or a series, I think sometimes it's good to get a sense of what you're looking at by just writing out the first few terms, which we practiced several times in the previous section. So we would have 1.2. That's when you have n is equal to 1. And then we would have uh, 1.2 square or 1.44, etc. You basically just have powers on uh, 1.2 as you multiply by 1.2 each time. It's squared cubed. So we might want to recognize this is a geometric sequence. with r equal to 1.2. So since r is larger than one in magnitude, that means that um, the size, uh, when you multiply by r each time, is gonna get larger and larger. This is basically growing by 20% every time, because you're multiplying by 1.2. And so therefore, it's gonna go off to infinity. So therefore, so the limit as n tends to infinity of 1.2 to the n is infinity. So therefore we would choose from above that it diverges. Uh, again, infinity is not a number. You cannot say something converges to infinity because infinity just keeps going and going and getting bigger and bigger. So instead we would say that it diverges. So then we want to conclude whether it's monotonic or does it oscillate. So that goes back to the definitions that I mentioned earlier. So monotonic would mean that it's strictly increasing or decreasing, that each term is bigger than the previous one or each term is less than the previous one. And in this case, since it's just getting larger and larger and larger by adding 20% every time, it's not oscillating in sign. It's not going up and down at all. It's just going up and up and up and up and up. So for that reason, we would also conclude that it's monotonic. It's monotonic, and in particular, we could add that it's a monotonic increasing function. I'm sorry, not function, but sequence. Questions, comments, discussion about this uh, other example from 8.2? I had a question, Professor. So is it the same uh, criteria as the geometric uh, series? Because I know we have the R, the R value it has to be less than, less than one. Um, so yes, well, the criteria is the same, but the goal of what the criteria is telling you is different. So when the magnitude of R is less than one, that means that the sequence converges to zero. The terms of the sequence converges to zero. But what that means about the series, we are not just looking at the terms themselves. The series is when you add all of those up. So the series would also converge, but not to zero. It would converge to the value of the formula, you know, a, uh, a sub one over one minus R. I see. So, um, so yeah, so there's a duality there in the sense that if the terms of a geometric series go to zero, 
that means the geometric series converges to some number, not zero. It'll never be zero be unless the series is just a bunch of zeros. Um, but instead, it'll be whatever the total of all of those numbers is when you add them up. But for the total of the series to actually converge to a some number, the, the sequence of partial sums has to go the, the has to converge to a number, which means the sequence of the values in the series must go to zero. Kind of think of it like the divergence test. For a geometric series, if R is less than one, then the terms in the sequence are going to zero. Therefore, the series can converge to a value. If they do not go to zero, like the divergence test, that means the series must diverge. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great question. Other questions, comments, discussions about any of these examples from 8.2? Okay, so two out of six done for chapter eight. Let's keep going. So in 8.3, Okay, hang on. I will. I'll be right back. One minute. So in 8.3, we finally get to series. And that's just, I'm saying finally, because series is what we end up working with in 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.4. So once we sort of really formally start series in 8.3, then we start doing a bunch of stuff based on, uh, about series after that. So um, we were just discussing a geometric sequence. And so um, they look at taking geometric sequence and adding all of the terms up and getting a geometric series. And this is one of the very most important things to think about when you first start working with series is the uh, geometric example. So there's a theorem 8.7. on page 621 about geometric series. And it basically says, as we've been saying all along, that if, so let's look at some of the language formally, if the absolute value, uh, this is for, sorry, for a geometric series. And a geometric series means you get the terms of the sequence that you're adding by multiplying the previous one by some constant number r. And so if the absolute value of that R, that constant ratio, that multiple is less than one, then, uh, and, and, um, uh, then the series converges. And if R, absolute value of R is greater than or equal to one, then the series diverges. And also, if it converges, it converges to a sub 1 over 1 minus r. And so this was very nice because it told us exactly when a geometric series converges and gave us a short little formula for how to figure out to what value it would converge. So we use this many times, very, very regularly. And so they look at general in this idea of sometimes just trying to figure out whether the series converges or diverges. But the geometric series is so important here because then after 8.3, 
when we're not actually determining a value, when we're just trying to see if a series converges or diverges, we start introducing tests. So in A3, right before we get to all of the convergence divergence tests, we have this one primary way that we can see if something converges or diverges. And we even have a formula to figure out what it would give you. So let's take a look at uh, example. So if I flip over to page 623, I could get to the exercise set. And let's grab one. So the instructions for this batch say evaluate each geometric sum. Let's maybe do a couple of these. So let's look at lucky number 13. And it has the summation as k goes from 0 to 6 of pi to the k. So um, uh, this is a good example to look at because even though I wrote the total for an infinite geometric series, we did also have a formula for a finite geometric series. Let me see if I can get the page number to refer you to for that since we're about to use it. They didn't have a box for it or anything. Um, so I'm going to point, I'm going to describe it this way. Note this is a finite instead of infinite geometric series. with the first term equal to one. Uh, again, what does this series look like? K is a zero, you get one. One K is a one, you get pi. One K is a two, you get pi squared. And then at the end, you'll get pi to the sixth. So in this case, it's not infinite, it's finite. But A sub one is equal to one and r is equal to pi. We're multiplying by pi each time because the power on pi just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So we use a formula for finite geometric series on the middle. of page 620. Trying to move this up, I'm almost out of space. So the sum would be equal to a sub one. Again, in the book, they don't write the sub one, they just write a, but they're referring to the first term of the series. So I keep putting that little a sub one there to help us remember that. And that's multiplied by a fraction of one minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r, like that. So in this case, the first term is a 1. And we would multiply by 1 minus pi to the sixth over 1 minus pi. And that's it. So that gives us a little formula. That's the exact value. You could, of course, put that into a calculator if you needed a decimal approximation. But uh, for otherwise, we are done. That's the answer that they wanted. Questions, comments, discussion about that first example I did for you? Okay, so let's try another example. So that was using a formula to find the total for a finite geometric series. So now let's maybe look at 20. Actually, let's just take a look at 16. Oops. 
Same page. So in this case, they don't give us a formula for the series. They just give us the first few terms. And again, it's still evaluate the series. And it's an infinite one. So we have two thirds. Oh, I'm wrong. Actually, let's do, let's do 17 because this one's just four terms. And 17, it actually has a technology symbol. So we can at least see what they would want us to type on the calculator at the end. So for 17, it has 1 fourth, 1 twelfth, 1 over 36. Ugh. It's not cooperating. Uh, 1 over 108. And then it has 1 over 29.16. So this is a technology problem, which is indicated in the book with a little T next to the problem. Just basically telling you, you're probably going to use a calculator to do this some way. OK, so let's do the 60 seconds to see if you could get this, uh, give this a try. And again, they just want you to come up with this summation. 1 fourth plus 1 12th plus 1 over 36, 1 over 108, up through 1 over 29, 16, and uh, to get an answer. Okay, so any questions, comments, or discussions before I do this for you? So uh, as I regularly try to suggest, the best way to think about doing problems like this is to first think about big picture questions for yourself. What kind of a problem is this? What is the goal of the problem? And then how would I figure that out? So since we have a sequence of numbers that is finite and everything is added up, then that tells us, first of all, that this is a, uh, sure why that's happening that this is a finite sequence just sort of a thought process for you to go through i'm sorry finite series because they're added up and if you're adding up a finite series especially if there's a dot 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 in the middle where you don't really know what what those terms are if they're not explicitly listed then how do you figure that out you have to recognize some sort of a pattern and the pattern in this case is to recognize that this is a geometric series with the first term equal to one fourth. And then how are they getting to the next term each time? They're multiplying by a three in the bottom. So that means that R is equal to one third. So when you have a finite geometric series, as we just indicated in the previous example, then you can do that with a formula, but you need to know three things. What the first term is, what R is, and what N is, how far does the geometric series go? If it's finite, there's some point, some nth number of terms. So we have to figure that out from the dot, dot, dot in the middle. So um, basically, that means we have to look at the last term and figure out how many powers of three did you multiply by to get there. So looking at 2916, it had to somehow be a denominator that we got by taking the first denominator of four and multiplying it by three n number of times. And we have to figure out what n is in order to see which term that is, the nth term, uh, so that we can look at our, our series. Okay, so that means that uh, maybe you would do this algebraically dividing both sides by four, for example. And so if I did that, uh, what do I get? Looks like 729 is the power of three that I'm looking for. And at this point, that's kind of guess and checkable. Uh, if I look at powers of three, I get nine for the number two, 
27 for number three, 81 for number four, which is 243 for number five, which is 729 for number six. So this gives me that n is equal to a six. So when I'm looking at my geometric series, I now know that n is equal to six. Well, actually, that's not quite right. <laughs> because this is the first term. So actually n isn't equal to seven if I'm gonna use my formula um, because uh, strictly using the formula, this is the first term, right? This is the second term, third term, fourth term. So the power on the, the n is lagging behind. This is where n starts with a zero and then goes up to six. That means this is the seventh term in the series that we get here just to be correct and make an adjustment. Okay, so then we can use the formula um, that I was just talking about. And again, n in the formula is equal to seven. So we'd have the summation is equal to, here again is the formula from the middle of that page, a sub one, one minus r to the n over one minus r. So in this case, the first term is one fourth. And then I'd be multiplying by one minus one third to the seventh over one minus one third. And then that'll just give you your answer. I won't bother to throw that into the calculator, but that's the formula. And then that gives you the total of this series. Questions, comments, discussions about this uh, example for a finite uh, series? from A3. We'll have to definitely do one with an infinite series next. Questions at all? Okay. All right, so let's do one more example just because we did a couple of finite ones. Uh, and now let's look at an infinite one. So let's look at 24, because that's kind of similar to one we did a minute ago. And again, it says evaluate each series or state that it diverges. And in 24, they just give us some terms. So in this case, we have a dot, 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 but there's nothing after it because the sequence goes on forever. So let's just go through this since we already did one similar to it. I'm sure many of you could do it, but uh, let's just continue real quick. So first thing to think about, imagine this problem just came up out of nowhere and you were tasked to evaluate. So the, in order to do this, you would say, what kind of a problem is this? What is the goal of the problem? And then how do I proceed to evaluate? So in this case, the thing to recognize is that this is a, a sequence of values that are added up, which means that it's a series and the list never stops. So first thing you'd think this is an infinite series. So for an infinite series, most of the time we are just figuring out if it converges or diverges, which is part of the goal of this problem. But if it converges, we're actually supposed to evaluate it. And so it's important to remember that for evaluating an infinite series, we'll typically be looking at a geometric series, unless we're gonna be allowed to evaluate it numerically in some way. So we do recognize that this is a geometric series because we can see that there's a pattern that you're just multiplying by pi in the bottom each time. So that means we have a geometric series with the first term equal to a one and the R value equal to one over pi that's being multiplied by each time. And it's infinite. So then we have a formula, the summation for an infinite geometric series with R having an absolute value less than one is the first term divided by one minus r. So a nice, even simpler formula than when you have a finite series. So the first term is a one and r is one over pi, which does have an absolute value of less than one. So that's the formula.
So this is equal to, well, I guess we would just leave it that way. <laughs> There's the exact value. Um, I, let's at least rationalize, make the fraction simpler by rationalizing uh, the little baby fraction there. We would do that by multiplying by pi in the top and the bottom so that we don't have a complex fraction with fractions in the top and the bottom. And so we would have pi over pi minus one. And can't really simplify that any better than that. Um, so you're done. Questions about uh, number 24 from the exercise set for 8.3? Okay. Okay, so then the fun begins. We have three sections of basically tests. So going forward after this first half of chapter eight, after the first three sections, the next three sections are all about testing to determine whether infinite series converge or diverge and they start throwing tests at us. So let's accumulate some tests. First test is the divergence test. So the divergence test is, tells us that if you have a series with A sub Ks and the limit as k goes to infinity of a sub k is not equal to zero, then the series of a sub k's diverges. So that means that one of the ways when you're looking at an infinite series to try to figure out if it converges or diverges is to look at the terms themselves. And if the terms in the series are not shrinking away to zero, and you can show that, then immediately know that the series, the sum of those terms diverges. It doesn't tell us if they are going to zero that it converges, because that's not always true. But nonetheless, this is a quick test if you think that it diverges because the terms don't go to zero, that you could then show that with the divergence test. And that was the, that's our first big test for divergence or convergence. So then we had next up is the integral test. So basically the integral test looks at a series of A sub Ks and, and it says that if you can, if the terms for the a sub k's can be expressed using a function that normally would be continuous and positive, has some restrictions on it. But basically, if you have this and the a sub k's can be used, calculated with a function. And this is often the way the terms for a series are given to us, like a sub k equals k squared or something like that. Even though we're only plugging in integer values into k, k is possibly a zero or a one and then going up from there. If the formula they use to give you what a sub k is, is a continuous positive function, well then you could consider the convergence or the divergence of the series directly connected to what the improper integral would be. So if you have a series of a sub k's and a sub k is equal to function values, where the function values, um, you know, for x being positive is a positive decreasing function, then the series of a sub k and the integral from one to infinity of that function, actually, let me take that back. 
of f of x dx both diverge or converge together. So this is helpful to us because it gives us a tool because we have done these improper integrals before back in 7.8, I believe it was. And we looked at some improper integrals and did convergence and divergence. And that basically means that we can now take that work we did back there and we can apply it to series that look the same as those functions that we worked with. And so one of the immediate things from this was the P series, which is kind of like another test, but it's a simple example that comes from this because back when we were integrating these things, the number one thing we looked at were power functions, where basically you have one over X to the P, then you could use an improper integral to see when that converged or diverged. Um, and that that produced what we're now gonna to refer to as another set test called the P series test. So of course there are things that you can integrate as well. And if the integral converges, then you can say the same thing or if it diverges. But the P series test was one of the biggest results from that. So they actually lumped that into calling it a new kind of test. So let's put that up here too. And then after that, probably we'll look at some examples of these things. As time permits, time is not our friend. So I'm gonna point out that the integral test basically led to what we then call the P-series test. So the P-series test is what you get because of the work that we did with integrals. And that's our uh, third test for section 8.4. Basically says if you have a series of one over X to the P, then if P is uh, a power that's greater than one, then this converges. And if P is less than or equal to one, then this diverges. All right, so those are the tests that were introduced to us in 8.4. And again, what are we starting in 8.4? We're starting what we'll do in 8.4 and 8.5 and 8.6 is we will use tests for convergence or divergence on infinite series. And in 8.4, we dive in by looking at and uh, coming up with these three tests in particular. So let's um, try to do some uh, examples perhaps to illustrate this work. Okay, so um, I'm over on uh, page 638 for the exercise set at the end of 8.4. And let's say that we maybe, let's take a look at number 12. I'm curious about it, just looking at it. Haven't done it, so let's try it. So it gives us the series as k goes from one to infinity of k squared over two to the k. So as is usually going to be from this point forward, it says determine whether the series converges or state that it uh, diver or, or that it diverges. Converges or diverges? Modifying the instructions a little bit to suit our needs, but. Okay, so again, we could try to look at the first few terms just to make sure we understand what's going on here. If K is a one, then I get one half. If K is a two, then I get one because I have two squared in the top and two to the second in the bottom. Um, if K is a three, then I have three squared in the top, which is nine, over two to the third in the bottom, which is eight. If K is a four, then I get 16 on the top, and two to the fourth is 16, which is a one. And I'm gonna put dot, dot, dot. So let me um, give you 
60 seconds to think about what you could do with this. And then we'll come back in. Okay, uh, so if I look at the instructions more carefully, I think I overstated the problem a little bit. Um, it says to just use the divergence test to see if it diverges or state that the test is inconclusive. So we could start with that, but then I think we could go ahead and think about trying to determine more seriously whether it converges or diverges, but we might have to use, um, certainly you could form an opinion at this point, but then after that we might want to use a test uh, like that would have been in the next section. So maybe this will be a good precursor to that. So having said all that, what's going on? So first of all, the question is, um, if we were using the divergence test, we would want to look at the limit as k goes to infinity of k squared over 2 to the k. And the idea is if this does not go to zero, then this diverges. And if this does go to zero, then the divergence test fails to help us. Well, at least it doesn't help us draw a conclusion. So do you, uh, what would we do to take this limit? So this is probably what chapter four problem or something, three or four. Anybody know how to evaluate this limit or anybody want to make a guess, even if they're not sure how to show it? Um, professor? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I think um, I remember that um, you said like exponentials will grow like way faster than just squares. So I think the limit will go to zero since um, well, two to the k will like go fast. Well, well, go to the infinity faster than k squared. Yeah, that's very good analysis. So that's an analytical approach. Um, one of the things that might help you with that is that we did have this sort of sequence of rates of growth of functions that helps you sort of quantify that. Um, and so I'm just pointing at that because I, I did say that and you're absolutely right, but one of the ways to verify that is looking at the rates of growths of functions. And there you'll see that exponential functions grow faster. And when that's the case, that means the limit of their ratio, that the faster growth ones will dominate. And in this case, since it's in the bottom, that would tell us that this limit is equal to zero. So that uh, Timothy is exactly right in terms of just doing that kind of analysis. Um, now, is there any way we could try to confirm this uh, with some sort of, uh, you know, algebraic approach or something, or some sort of uh, way to actually not guess but evaluate this limit? Maybe if there's anyone in our group that's French, they could help with this. Is it L'Hopital's rule? That's the one, the French guy to the rescue. <laughs> I'm not saying you're French, but L'Hopital was French. <laughs> yeah, so when you have a ratio and the top and the bottom are both going to infinity, then that's an example where you could use L'Hopital's rule. And what, if you use L'Hopital's rule here twice, then the top will just become a two and the bottom will still have two to the K in it and will go to infinity. And that causes the whole thing to go to zero. So Two, two, um, two applications of L'Hopital's rule will get this to a point where we can confirm uh, Tim Timothy's uh, correct conjecture that this limit is zero. All right, so if this limit is zero, then or so the divergence test uh, has no conclusion. That means the divergence test says we're not able to determine if this, con if this converges or diverges. Now, as Timothy was pointing out, by recognizing that the denominator goes to zero or goes to infinity much faster than the numerator, 
that gives us, a, gives us a suggestion that not only these terms go to zero, but that probably the series converges. That would be the intuition that you can draw from that. Um, but uh, cheating a little bit, just because we are trying to review all the whole chapter and we've done this before, what divergence convergence test would I apply to this since the divergence test failed to give us a conclusion? Can anybody think of a suggestion? Would it be the ratio? Yeah, I think so. I think we'd use the ratio test. So let's try that. Let's go ahead and apply that because that would be the first thing we'd be looking at in 8.5 anyway. And maybe we'll just have done an example in advance. So let's say since the divergence test failed, what about the ratio test? So then we would be looking at the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth plus oneth term over the kth term. So that would be k plus one squared over two to the k plus one. And I would multiply by the reciprocal of the kth term since I'm supposed to divide by it. And that would be two to the k over k squared. And the ratio test said that if this gives me, well, what does it say? Anybody? Well, I, we'll get to that next. So I'll just remind us, if this gives me a, uh, a constant that's less than or equal, uh, less than one, then I know that this series converges. If it gives me a constant that's greater than one or goes to infinity, then I know it diverges. And if it gives me one, then the test fails to be conclusive. So how would I do this? Again, we can do some simplification here. So if I have two to the K in the top and two to the K in the bottom, that means I have one more factor of two in the bottom than they do in the top. So these cancel out with that, just leaving a two in the bottom. So I can rewrite this as the limit as k goes to infinity of one half times k plus one over k squared. So a um, little bit out of space here and we are a section ahead of ourselves, but you may or may not be able to recall or see that if I have the limit as k goes to infinity of k plus one over k, that that stuff in there becomes a one. So this whole thing would therefore have a limiting value of one half. And therefore we would say this converges. Questions, comments, discussions about this uh, example? All right, so this is a good example, I think, also of how you want to at least consider the divergence test. Can you explain again why that became a one? Yeah. Okay, so a question about this part here, I think. So if I have the limit as k goes to infinity of k plus one over k, um, again, I can ignore the power of two outside because when you're using a limit of something inside of a function and the function's continuous, you can pass the limit to the inside part. Um, and if we're doing this, the way to see that this simplifies to a one, as I would uh, divide out by the biggest power in the top and the bottom of this rational expression by multiplying the top and the bottom by one over k. And so if I did that, sorry, a little cramped here, I would actually then get the limit as k goes to infinity, oh, this is not working, of one plus one over k over one, and then that little part would go to zero. Sorry, that was kind of scratched in there. I can write that out more fully. Um, Kristen, is that enough, or you want me to write that out a little bit better? If I left you confused. Okay, 
And at that point, you have a little rational function and you can evaluate the limit by looking at the powers of the dominant terms, which in that case are both ones. Okay, great question. Other questions about any part of this example before we look at another one? Okay. Okay, so uh, let's try jumping ahead a dozen or two problems. Let's try, uh, this is on the same page, but let's note it. This is page 638, exercise set at the end of it. Uh, let's try maybe looking at, um, 39. Find a, I don't want to go too much into that. Actually, let's do 34. Determine the convergence or divergence of the following series. And we have the summation as k goes from 1 to infinity. And it has 1 divided by the cube root of 27k squared. Ah, too ugly. So um, what I was recommending when we were doing all of these tests is that you start to try to develop almost an intuition for these. Um, and hopefully now that we've been through chapters eight and nine, maybe some people were starting to be able to do that. But let's ask, does someone have an opinion if they just look at this? So we can simplify this a little bit. Maybe that'll help. So when you have a root, cube root, square root, or whatever, if you have factors underneath, you can separate those. So I could write this as 1 over the cube root of 27 times the cube root of k squared. And 27 is a perfect cube of 3. So the cube root of 27 is just a three. And then that three in the bottom of the fraction, I can pull out of the whole series. So this is just one third times the series. So K goes from one to infinity. And then when I have the cube root of K squared, well, a cube root is like a one third power. So that becomes K squared to the one third power which is k to the two-thirds. So I'm using these algebraic manipulations in order to rewrite the series in a way that I can try to better recognize what's going on. And when I get to this point, the thing to recognize is that this is now example of a p-series. And then I could use the p-series test where this is the power p. And as we wrote up earlier, when we wrote up the p-series test, if the p number is less than or equal to 1, then we know the series diverges. If the p number is greater than 1, and this is in size, then we know the series converges. So in this case, the value is 2 thirds, which is less than 1. So we say, therefore, it diverges by p-series test.
questions, comments, discussions about the, this number 34 from the exercise set? So the question is, why does it diverge? So the P-series test said, if you have a series of one over K to the P, then if P is less than or equal to one, it diverges. If P is greater than one, it converges. So in this case, two thirds is our P value and it's less than one. So it diverges. Examples that are super simple is that the series of one over K to the one half diverges compared to one over K squared, which converges. And so those, those are your simple sort of two examples to think about. And one over K to the one half is one over the square root of K. And you can compare those because we also did those kinds of values in 7.8 when we looked at improper integrals. And that kind of, that's kind of what set us up to this, uh, you know, one over K is a, also a good comparison of a divergent series because that's the harmonic series. Okay, other questions at all about this? We have what, an hour left, wow. And we have to do eight, five, eight, six. We have six more sections to do. We've only done four sections. Okay, we we'll have to speed things up, guys. <laughs> I'll go ahead and take a break when we get to the end of chapter eight, a very short one, and then we'll look at nine in, a, uh, in the follow-up, but we do need to move quickly. Hopefully this review is gonna get people's minds back into the chapter eight and nine material though. Okay. Let's get bigger like that. Okay. So, uh, well, we did just do an example from 8.5 basically, because in 8.5 we introduced more tests and let me just sort of list them and then we'll just go right to examples as time is more of the essence. So we have the ratio test, not the Batio test. Ay, ay, ay. Pen is not cooperating. Apologize. Let me see if this makes a difference. So we had the ratio test. Next up was the root test. Then we had a comparison test. Limit comparison test. So we already saw an example of a ratio test, but let me point out that I did say that the ratio test is your number one go-to test. You're gonna to wanna to just be used to using that a lot. You wanna be thinking about using a lot. It's a good thing Parjeet thought to use it on the example we talked about so far because it's our number one test we wanna think about. So now let's uh, try some examples. They start on page 647. 
And let's grab um, number 12. 12 looks a little simpler than the one that we already did using the ratio test. I'm almost, uh, not a little simpler, almost the same, but is a little bit more complicated. So it has the series, so k goes from one to infinity. Before we had k squared over two to the k, but this time we have k to the power of k. So let's try this. Uh, as often is a good idea when you're a little confused or at all is maybe let's write out the first few terms of what's going on in this series. When k is a one, I have one half. When k is a two, I have one. When k is a three, I have three to the third over two to the third, which is 27 over eight. When k is a four, I have four to the fourth over two to the fourth. So that's, trust me, 16. So what you may actually see here is that the top is growing bigger faster than the bottom. And that I could say, for example, when k is bigger than 2, k to the k is bigger than 2 to the k. And thus, a sub k is bigger than 1. So the series diverges by the divergence test. Uh, that's how I would write up a solution. Maybe it became a little too hard to follow. So questions, comments, discussions about number 12. Again, the divergence test says if the terms themselves are not going to zero, then the series diverges. And in this case, after the second term, every term is bigger than one, <laughs> a lot bigger than one. In fact, the terms themselves in this case are going off to infinity. They're certainly not going to zero. So this diverges. And um, maybe you could have also thought of it this way. K, oops, that's K to the K over two to the K is K over two to the K. So you have a term in the middle that very quickly is one, you know, bigger than one with the top number just being divided by two, but the top number is going to infinity, and then you're raising that to a bigger and bigger power. So this would be the kind of series where you'd like to think that you could just look at that and within uh, 10 seconds, if you think about it, you'll see, oh my God, that's got to diverge because the terms themselves are not, even, not only are they not going to zero, they're going to infinity. That's very aggressive divergence. Okay, well, let's move on because we got lots to cover and not enough time to do it. Let's look at another example. So, let's try uh, maybe 25. Again, we're trying to determine convergence or divergence. And in 25, they write out terms. One plus one half squared plus one third cubed plus one fourth to the fourth. And they're being a little bit nice here in this problem, at least in the fact that they are not applying those powers. 
Like they could have said one plus one fourth plus one twenty seventh plus one two sixteenth or whatever the heck it is. Um, but instead they showed you the format of the fraction being raised to a power so that you can observe the pattern. But as with most of these problems at this point, we're trying to figure out, converge or diverge. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. So let me just do this for you. Uh, and then of course, speak up if you have a question or a comment. So I would take note that this is the summation as K goes from one to infinity of one over K to the K power. So when we, uh, again, big picture, we're trying to feel, figure out if this converges or diverges. This is an infinite series and we have a bunch of tests to do that. So you start thinking about what kind of test you would use. Right away you say, are the terms going to zero? Because if not, then it obviously diverges, but they are because we have a bottom of a fraction raised to a power getting bigger. Um, you could even maybe make a comparison to a P-series test pretty quickly to suggest that this has to converge. Um, but more specifically, anytime you have an expression that's raised to the K power, that's a suggestion that maybe you want to use the root test because then you get to do the kth root. So to use the root test, again, I would suggest by intuition, you might be able to say very quickly that this converges, but let's be more formal and see how the root test would help us here. So you would take the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth root of a sub k, and you would try to sort of compare that. You would come up with the, uh, well, for the, um, the ratio test, it was an R. I think for the root test, they used a row symbol. Um, but anyway, um, in this case, that's, and then we would use the same criteria about if it's equal to a one, we don't know. If it's bigger than a one, then it diverges. If it's less than a one, then it converges, kind of like the ratio test. So, but in this case, that's the limit as k goes to infinity of the kth root of one over k to the k. So we like the root test when things are raised to a k power because then we can take the kth root of that. In this case, we get that that's the limit as k goes to infinity of just one over k, which is zero. Therefore, this converges by the root test. Questions, comments, discussion? Professor, when you said uh, we can do this by intuition, did you mean when we when we were adding up all the uh, what's it called all the terms and we saw that it go that the terms go to zero? Uh, yeah, or I said even comparing to the p test. So so here, take a note here, take a look. You could write this as one over k to the k, right? Yeah. And as soon as k is bigger than two this is going to be less than one over k squared. Mm -hmm. And we know one over k squared converges by the p-series. I see. So if you just had the k in the bottom raised to the second power, that's our super simplest example of convergence by the p-series. Well, now instead of having k raised to the second power in the bottom, you have k raised to the k power, which just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's got to even be faster convergence than 1 over k squared. Does that make sense? Yeah, let's see that. Yeah, but of course, you don't need to look at that intuitive side. You can just apply the root test, and it gives you the answer almost as quickly. Good question. Other questions or discussion about this one before we... Move on. All right, so we already did an example with a ratio test in the previous part. Here we did an example of the root test. Uh, so I'm going to move on to 8.6 so that hopefully we can get through most of what we wanted to today.
So in 8.6, we looked at alternating series. So that just allowed all of a sudden things to change signs. So all of a sudden we have a series as k often goes from zero to infinity, it could be a one. And basically where you have negative one to the k, because we like to start with a positive term, so I have zero. And then I'm gonna have like with times some a sub k's after that. Or just to show you that it's arbitrary, I can change the starting value of k to the first power because up in my power here, I can put a minus one here. And so basically this was positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And even though I would like to go right to examples, I need to point out the quintessential example that illustrates the importance of the alternate, uh, alternating series. And that is to note that the series as k goes from one to infinity of one over k, one plus one half plus one third, et cetera, is the harmonic series, which we showed earlier diverges. This is the crucial, uh, this can be looked at as the P series where the power on K is a one. So this is the value for the power where you switch from convergent to divergent. When the power is bigger than one, it converges, but as soon as the power is one or less than one, you get divergence. That's called the harmonic series. This is crucial. And what we learn in the alternating series is that if you take this divergent harmonic series and you let the terms alternate, meaning you have one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth, et cetera then we get the alternating harmonic series. That looks terrible. Feeling rushed, feeling the pressure of the clock. We get the alternating harmonic series. which converges. And so what this shows is that if you have a series that wasn't alternating, but it, and it diverged and went off to infinity, that by causing the terms to alternate and sign, because you get some cancellation along the way in your attempt to accumulate value, that can change a divergent series, which was going off to infinity in its total, to be a convergent series, which converges on a number. Just by changing it so that the signs alternate. And so they even introduced a definition about this idea that when you have a series, there may be three situations. There may be the situation that when it, that the series originally diverged, but then after you made the terms alternate, it converged, like this example with the alternating harmonic series. So in that situation, we call that conditional convergence, or that it converges conditionally. Because its ability to converge is conditional on whether the signs alternate or not. Then we had the possibility that Maybe when the signs alternate, it converges, but when they're all the same, it converges anyway. So certainly by making the signs alternate, you make the total less than it would have been. So if it converged before they alternated, then it's absolutely going to converge after they alternate, and we call that absolute convergence. Again, absolute convergence is whether it doesn't matter whether the terms alternate or not, the series still converges. 
And then the third situation is that uh, the, um, the alternating series diverges. If when the terms alternate, the series diverges, well then when they don't alternate, it's definitely still gonna diverge because you're not gonna get um, more of an opportunity to converge when all the terms are positive than when they alternated in sign, you're gonna get less of an opportunity. So this is kind of the three situation. Let's say you're looking at a, an alternating series. It either diverges even though it's alternating or it converges and it converges only when it's alternating. So that's conditional convergence, convergence, or it converges even if it wasn't alternating and that's absolute convergence. So the importance of all of this in 8.6 was that absolute convergence implies convergence. And this gave us a way to test alternating series. For an alternating series, you first consider that it wasn't alternating and use all of the tests that we looked at in 8.4 and 8.5. If when it's not alternating, you can show that the all positive terms converge with the ratio test or the root test or something like that, then that means that it converges absolutely and therefore the alternating version also converges. If when you're looking at an alternating series, you look at all of the positive terms and you don't get convergence, you get divergence, well then that doesn't still tell you whether the alternating series converged or not. You just weren't able to use absolute convergence to get convergence for the alternating version. So then you have to use the alternating convergence test, which basically says if the terms go to zero and they're strictly decreasing in size, then you get convergence. So I've summed that all up quickly because I don't have time to write it all out, but let's go ahead and look at some examples to see if that could help us. And also at the um, end of 8.5 was a big, huge uh, table that sort of summed all the tests up in one box. So let's look at that as well. Okay, so let's clear this. Remind us about this big important table with the nice summation. So, on page 656 is a, a, a summary table, uh, 8.4, lists all the tests. So then let's look at the exercise set. Uh, let's go over on page 657, the next page. And let's find a good example. Let's go as time permits. Let's look at 48. So it says in the instructions, determine whether the following series converge absolutely, converge conditionally, or diverge. So those are the three situations I was just describing. Converges absolutely, converges conditionally, or diverges. Those are the three possibilities. So in 48, the series they give us is the summation as k goes from one to infinity of minus one third to the k. So again, what's going on here? The first term would be minus one third. The next term, because it's squared, would be a positive one ninth minus one over 27 plus one over 81, et cetera. So because the thing that's in the power is alternating, then uh, because it's a minus sign to a power, it's an alternating series. And we're supposed to look at three things, convergent, 
Absolutely, convergent, conditionally, or divergent. So um, maybe the intuition is helping here. Maybe not. We don't have a lot of time. So I would point out that this is a geometric series with r equal to negative one third and the absolute value of r is less than one. So what that means is, is that we know this converges. In fact, we know the value that it converges to. Uh, so converges. But we're still supposed to conclude whether it converges conditionally or absolutely. So converges to uh, negative one third over one minus negative one third. That's the formula for a divergent series. So it converges to whatever that number is. I'm sure it's a nice simple number to figure out. But we need to see if the absolute value of these terms converge to see if it's absolutely convergent or if the absolute value of the terms diverge but the alternating version converge, then it would be conditionally convergent. So then, Note that the absolute, uh, the, the series uh, of one to infinity of the absolute value of minus one to the K, uh, that's supposed to be the absolute value. Is the series of just one third to the K. which also is a convergent geometric series. So the alternating version converges absolutely which is what they wanted to know. <laughs>